Everyone seeing a PowerPoint? Yes. So learning objective three talks about a very interesting control feature, and that is the actual bank account. Because if you think about it, cash has two records. You have a record of what's happening to cash in a business, but you're dealing with a bank. So the bank actually has a record of what's happening in your account. Um, and that makes it a very good control feature, actually having a bank statement. So every month, bank statements are usually available. And the idea is to look at your bank statement and look at your books. Notice what the differences are, okay? Because there will be differences and explain the differences. That's basically what a bank reconciliation is. You should be able to explain the differences to the point where they equal, okay? And that's what you're gonna learn about today. All right, so I'm gonna go right to the bank statement. This is a very important statement to understand. Um, again, it usually is, uh, is cut as of a certain uh, day, uh, usually at the end of a month, right? Uh, and it's usually for a specific, right? Each statement is for a specific account. Now there's nothing stopping businesses from having more than one account. It's like, there's nothing stopping you from having more than one savings account or more than one checking account. Uh, businesses have the same. Right. There's nothing stopping them from having multiple uh, different accounts for various purposes. So whatever's happening in this account is happening here. You'll see the beginning balance on the statement. The ending balance from the statement is the beginning balance of the next statement. Um, you'll notice that every time money is put into the account, whether that's a deposit or, or something else, the bank is going to call it a credit. Okay, a credit to your account. Now, again, I'll, I'll show you, explain to you why the bank sees it that way in a minute. Um, but, uh, but basically speaking, all the amounts going into your account will be looked upon as a credit for, for the bank. Uh, all the amounts coming out of your account, whether it's checks or whatnot, will be considered debits. Okay, uh, and I will tell you why. So if you look at a bank, right uh all of those deposits for a bank right are our liabilities okay so to a bank your deposits are liabilities to the bank because it's your money so it's your asset the bank owes you that back with interest so they owe it to you. that's why it's a bank liability so all accounts checking accounts, savings accounts, uh, certificate deposit accounts, et cetera. They are all bank liabilities. And which is why every time you put money in, they will credit your account because to them, their liability is going up, okay? And every time money comes out of the account, guess what? Their liability to you goes down. So that's why you have a debit card because when you use a debit card, the bank is lowering its liability to you for your account because you've taken that money out. So they don't owe you that anymore. So that's really how banks see the world. And that's how they screw you up when you take your very first accounting class. Because this is basically how you've learned those terms. And it's like, ah, oh, God, I hate this. Um, technically, th this is correct from the bank's perspective. Your, your savings or checking account is a liability to the bank. No doubt about it, because it's your asset. Can't be the bank's asset, it's your asset. Um, so that's, that's why, and I hope that makes a little bit of sense. So any deposits are credited into your account, the balance goes up. Any checks or other things when you use your debit card, whatever, those, that lowers your balance, and so they have an ending balance at the, uh, at the end of the month, okay. So here they actually list all of the um, I can't read. all the debits are listed here on, on this column here, um, which means all the times that you wrote a check are listed here, or you electronically sent funds out of your account, um, or in in the case that they actually needed to take money out of your account for fees, that's what's called the debit memo. Okay. Um, it's a memo that they're taking money out of your account 
and it's a debit memo because they're taking money out of your account. That's how they do it on the debit side. Um, there's also non-sufficient funds. This NSF is basically money you thought you had because someone gave you a check and you put it in your bank like, oh, I got the money. And the bank tried to get col collect on that check and there was no money to collect. So they take the money out of your account and say, oh, by the way, that check you thought you had, it bounced. So uh, that's an NSF check. Mm -hmm. um, other debit memos could also include debit uh, service charges every time they have fees. They're going to take that out of your account. So that would also be in your debit column on your bank statement. Um, the amounts that have been credited to your account have been added to your account. And so what's usually added to your account are all those deposits. Uh, if the bank collected something for you, because uh, sometimes you can pay, uh, well, banks sometimes can collect money for, for their clients. And so they can pay um, that. So Hope is asking, do you know why banks charge a fee when you don't have, they're greedy. That's how they make a living. And fees, it's your money. I just, I just don't like to talk about banks because I, you have to take my personal finance class to really get me to rant, uh, you know, on, on banks. They're absolutely necessary, but they have to treat people better. Let's put, it, let's put it that way, because it is your money. You're lending your money to the bank and your bank puts all these things in, in the way, like those fees. It just pisses me off a lot because, you know, when, when you take a loan from, it's like the loan your bank giving you a loan, then you putting all the demands on the bank. Well, in order for me to pay, it's going to cost you this fee. They would never tolerate that. So why are we? We're in the same position. I don't know. We just, you know, it, it's just not a very fair relationship for sure. Not that we can divorce ourselves totally from banks, but we can certainly find a better banking partner for damn sure. Um, so all these, all these credits are simply money that's coming in and adding to your account. Okay. Uh, something that they could put you put in your account is interest that you've earned. That's money that's being credited in your account because that's your money now, so they owe it to you. And then, of course, they have a daily balance record going on the side. Okay. So bank statements are extremely important to know about here. Uh, the bank statement has, as I've already said, um, the bank statement is going to show right everything that's that's been paid. Uh, and any so anything any money going out would be on the debit side. Any money coming in to the bank on your account would look like a credit a credit to your account. Um, they would also take money out of your account to you know pay fees uh, or if a check bounced, so you'd see a debit memo. Uh, credit memos are when they're putting money into your account, whether you've earned interest or they collected money on your behalf and put it in your account. Um, that's basically what those terms mean that you have to be uh, aware of. Now, your bank statement is going to be dated a particular date, usually the end of the month. Um, that's different than your books. When you actually are doing your books, you're recording it as it's happening. So you make that deposit, you put it in your books. You cut checks, you start subtracting it right from your books. So your book balance is clearly going to be different from your bank balance because of just the lag in, in when it hits the accounts. Okay. Um, but these time lags are basically the key in understanding how do we reconcile it. So what do we reconcile? Well, the first thing we look at is something called a deposit in transit, which means we've made a deposit. And so we've wrote it down in our books that we have that money in the account but it doesn't show up on the bank statement yet. Okay, that's a deposit in transit. And this happens a lot. I mean, if you bank, by the way, I know a lot of banks say, oh, we're open on weekends. That's nice. Or we're open late on Fridays, whatever. That's nice. You know, banks are only really open Monday to Friday. And that's because they are members and part of the Federal Reserve System. So if the Federal Reserve System is simply a Monday through Friday operation. <laughs> okay. Um, the fact that you can bank late on a Friday is nice, but all that money is going to be counted basically on Monday. The fact that the bank is open, you can do banking on Saturday. That's also very, very nice. It's very convenient for you. But it, the banking system is going to look at it as a Monday transaction because that's the first day they can really process that in full. 
So it's nice that banks are open all the time, but basically anything that happens usually after three o'clock in the afternoon is counted for the next day. Okay. So it's an odd system. It's an odd system. So you could be done with your, you could have a really good, you know, kind of a restaurant. You could have made a ton of money that night and stuck it in the bank. You wrote it in, you had that deposit. And then it's like, I don't see it on the bank statement yet. No, that's a deposit in transit. An outstanding check means you've already wrote the check. So you've wrote a check and you've paid a bill. The problem, and so you took it out of your books. You, you don't see that money on your, on your book record. However, the bank hasn't paid it yet. Right, because who you write that check to, they put the money in their bank account. Then their bank contacts your bank, says, hey, I got a, an order for $50 to be transferred. Your bank says, okay, we can do that. And they send it. Or your bank says, $50, they don't have $50. Can't pay it. That's a non-sufficient fund. That's, that's a bounce check. That's basically how it works. So thankfully, it's mostly all done electronically. So, uh, but it still takes a little bit of time. Usually one to three days, depending. Uh, we already talked a little bit and heard about bank memoranda. That's usually a debit memo or a credit memo, depending on whether they're taking money out of your account or putting money in your account. So we're going to be looking at that. And another thing that happens is errors. Most of these errors are human errors. And overwhelmingly they happen on the business they happen on the business end and the personal end they don't happen on the bank end not that banks don't make errors they do but it's a rare thing it's a pretty rare thing now um so most of the time you and the most common error is something called a transposition error so for example let's say you wrote a check uh to pay a bill for for 54 dollars right and you wrote that check out and then you went to put it in your book. And instead of writing 54, you wrote 45. That's a transposition error. In other words, the numbers are in the wrong position, transposition. And so you subtracted 45 from your book versus 54, which is what you wrote the check for. And that happens a lot. Transpositions um, are easy to spot because they always have a multiple of nine, okay? So you remember your timetables from when? Second, third grade. Um, so 9, 18, 27, 36, 45, 54, 63, 72, 81, 90. Um, it's gonna be a factor of nine. And when you when you take the difference, cause here, this the difference between this is nine. So you're gonna have that. So 63 versus 36, that's $27 difference. It's a factor of nine. So you're, you're always gonna have that in an error. That's the most common error. Of course, there could be others, but that certainly is the most common. So that brings us to how we reconcile. The most, uh, the easiest thing to do is reconcile the bank statement. And how we do that is we list the balance on the bank statement. That's the first thing we do. Usually we only need to do two things to the bank statement. We're gonna add in any deposits in transit and we're gonna subtract out any outstanding checks. There's very rarely bank errors, very rarely. But these two, you're gonna do all the time. So you start with the bank statement balance, add the deposits in transit, subtract out the outstanding checks, which is the bank hasn't paid those checks yet. And that'll give you a corrected balance for the bank. This is gonna be the first step and it's the easiest step to do. The one that's a little bit more complex is reconciling your records, your books, your books at the business. Uh, you do that by taking the uh, balance you have on the books as of that day, okay? And then you have a series of adjustments to make, okay? If the bank collected any money for you and deposited in your account, well, you have to add that to your books because you did not know the bank did that. So you have to add that to the book. Um, if the bank tells you a check bounced, you didn't know that. So you have to subtract that out of your cash. Because when you got the check, you thought you had the cash. But when the bank said, hey, it bounced, now you're going to take it away from your, from your cash and go get that money from, uh, uh, from your client. Any service uh, fees. Banks love fees. You know how it is. Um, 
And so basically speaking, you'll see it on the statement, they took out so much for, for fees. And so you have to subtract that from your cash once you find out about it. And then company errors can go either way. Sometimes you subtract out too much and so you gotta add it back in. Sometimes you subtract out too little and you gotta, <laughs> you gotta subtract it out again for cash. So um, once you do all of that, your corrected balance from your books should match your corrected balance from your, um, from your bank. And this is basically something that you're gonna be spending most of your time on this week. This is, this is the one. There is an illustration in your book on how to do this. And I recommend that you look at it, okay? So again, uh, we'll break it down. There's a bank statement for Laird. It has the balance per bank. When it says the balance per bank, that's on the bank statement. So that's the bank statement balance for April 30th. On this date, the balance of the cash per book. So when it says cash per books, that's the company books. That's what that's what your company record is. Seven, 11,709 and change, right? So then there's the following reconciliate, uh, reconciling items. There are deposits in transit. So a deposit in transit you have in the books, you don't see it on the bank statement. That's why you add it to the bank statement. Outstanding checks, you've wrote these checks, you already have it in your books. You don't see it in the bank statement. That's why we reconcile to the bank statement, okay. Uh, here, there were other deposits there. Were, it seems as though your bank collected money for you, okay? And you didn't know about it. So that means it's already on the bank statement. The bank collected money for you. You're just finding out, so you've got to update your books. There are some other stuff that happened, including your bank telling you that one of those checks that you thought were yours is useless, no cash. So now you have to update your books. The bank knows about it, you don't. You gotta update your books. The bank took out fees. They love fees, look at that, two different fees. They all dress up on a certain day. They love to party when they do this, it's a big, fiesta at the bank, uh, you know, when they charge these fees. But anyway, fees are taken away from you. You see that on the bank statement, you've got to update your books, right? And then lo and behold, the company made an error, not uncommon. So it looks like one of the checks that you wrote was written for 1226, which is what it's supposed to be written for, okay, was to pay a bill. However, when you put it in your books, you subtract it out 1262. Again, 6226, transposition error. Yeah. Um, and so basically speaking, you, uh, you have to, it's a $36 error, which is a, it's a multiple of nine. So basically speaking, what you've got here is if you subtract it out too much, you subtract it out 1262, you should have only subtracted out 1226. You got to put the other $36 back in your cash. Okay. So these, this is, this is going to affect your, your bank statement. These are all going to affect your books. And now you're just putting them in order. Your bank statement balance plus your deposits in transit minus your outstanding checks gives you an adjusted balance of 12, 204 and change. Your book balance, plus the money they collected for you, uh, plus the money you have to add back in because you wrote, you wrote the number wrong, minus the NFS check, minus the fees. There's two different fees. Gives you an adjusted balance of 12, 204 and change. They match, you're done. This is a very good illustration. You just need to make sure you're, you're doing it. Now, anything that affects your books, anything, anything that affects your books needs to be recorded. In other words, you got to make a journal entry for it. So let's do those. Entries are important only if it affects the books. Okay. So when that uh, bank collected that money from uh, for a customer from us, uh, we have to debit cash for that amount. And because they were collecting something that was a receivable to us, we'll credit the accounts receivable to show we've already collected that or received it. 
When you look at the bank error, it was $36 too much when we paid a bill. So we add that $36 back into cash. That's why it's a debit to cash. But now we also have to um, credit the accounts payable account. Okay, that's important. I just have a collapse of my water bottles here. Um, the next thing is that bounce check. Now, usually that bounce check is because you were waiting to receive money and, and you got it, but it, or, you, or they paid you what you thought was a good check and it was bad. So now you gotta go back and receive that. You're gonna send that person a bill. So you're gonna debit your receivables because that's now you're waiting to receive that money and you're gonna credit cash because you don't have it. You thought you did, but you don't. And all those wonderful fees, right? Uh, all those uh, fees, bag, this, it could be a miscellaneous expense, bank fee expense, could be any type of name for this expense, but it's an expense. And we're crediting cash to show that it's coming out. Okay. So look what happened to cash through this reconciliation process. We had to add the $1,035 that the bank collected. We had to put back the $36 in cash because we we subtracted it out incorrectly when we're paying our bills. And then of course we had to record the fact that we didn't have this money, it went out. So this is how we adjust a bank reconciliation. And that's basically what you're gonna be doing, okay? Um, the do it exercise here sort of breaks it down for little old Sally, uh, who's the owner of this fabric company. And she's like, what is going on? I got a debit memo for an NFS check. So an NFS check means you thought you had the cash because you put the check in your, in your bank account and the bank saying that that's not cash. So obviously you, your books are too high. So you got to deduct it from your books. You don't have that cash, take it out of your books. Um, an electronic funds, a credit memo for electronic funds. So a credit memo, every time you see that word, from a bank's perspective, you got more money, <laughs> okay? So in this case, um, we have to add that cash to the books. Uh, outstanding checks, you know, um, you don't see it on the bank statement. So your bank statement has to be adjusted and it's adjusted by reducing it. And a deposit in transit is not something you see on the bank statement, but if you did, you would need to add it. Okay. All right. The very last thing we're going to be looking at, I'm going to get to the point here on learning objective four. Uh, it basically gives you definition of, of cash um, and reminds you that this is, this is certainly on the balance sheet. What it does also is give you a definition of what's a cash equivalent. So a cash equivalent basically is something that's a short-term highly liquid investment that you can convert basically that same day, uh, or it's gonna be so close to its maturity that it can, it's gonna be turned into cash very, very soon. So you will see on company records, on balance sheets, cash and cash equivalents. So they're just simply making a little bit of a distinction there. Some boards of directors can restrict the use of cash to a special purpose. So literally you would see on occasional balance sheets, something called a restricted cash. And that's because the board of directors have said, well, we're gonna, we have to use this cash for this specific purpose only, put it aside. So it comes out of the cash account into its own restricted cash. But I can't tell you anymore because it's restricted. Ha, ha, ha. All right, so basically that is uh, part of, of that. The last part of this uh, objective is looking at managing and monitoring cash. Cash is used for everything, buying inventory, pay bills, et cetera. So making sure that cash is being collected and coming in is very, very important. Uh, so there are some basic principles of cash management that they wanna introduce you to. Do everything you possibly can to collect those receivables quickly because receivables are gonna be turned into cash and you want that cash. Uh, you can also use too much cash if you buy too much inventory. And so keeping inventory uh, at a lower than average rate will help you save cash, right? Because in a lot of ways. 
Uh, make sure that you're monitoring payment of liabilities. You want to make sure you're paying your bills and paying them on time. Uh, but why give away cash too early? You know, uh, unless there's something in it for you, like a discount. Um, usually, there are some companies will sometimes have major expenses. So basically, they're they're going along and their normal life is cash uh, is limited to this amount. But sometimes there's periods of time where they need a ton of cash. And so, because they're expanding a factory or whatnot. So they have to make sure that they are timing their needs to get a bunch of cash when they need it for something. So uh, usually that comes around a major capital expenditure. And they always, always, always have to invest cash. You just can't have cash lying around. Uh, sometimes having too much cash in the bank is just not good. You need to make sure you get high interest on that cash. So that's all part of that. And one way in which they, they anticipate and monitor things is through this cash budget. And this is where we're gonna be ending tonight. Um, so a cash budget basically looks at an anticipated cash flow for usually a year's period. You can do more, but a year is, is typical. And what do we do? We look at cash, well, we look at how much cash we have. We look at how much cash we're gonna be receiving usually in a, in a quarter, a period of three months. We look at how much money we need to disperse in that three month period, and we compare. If we don't have enough cash, or if our bank balance will be too low and we don't want it that low, we probably need to borrow some money. So there's gonna be a financing activity. Um, and so that's basically how it works. So Hayes Company here, this is a sample cash budget that they give you. Hayes Company likes to keep at least $15,000 in cash. So the lowest they ever wanna see their cash is 15,000. So when you look at the first quarter, they start the first quarter with 30, we're only looking at this column, okay? They start the quarter with 38,000. They're gonna be receiving 170,000 more, which means they have $208,000 of cash in total between where they started and what they're going to receive. Looks like they're going to need a lot of cash to disperse. So their total disbursements are $182,500. So the difference between all of this cash that they have and all the cash they need is $25,500. Now that's well above the $15,000 they would like. So they keep that in the bank at the end of the month, uh, first quarter. The ending balance in cash at the end of this quarter is the beginning balance in cash for the next quarter, okay? Because you're just literally waking up the next day uh, from say March 31st, to April 1st, boom, next quarter, all right? So here they start with this amount of cash. They're looking at, at getting another 198,000 in cash. So they're gonna have a total of 233,000, sorry, 223,500 in cash available to them. They need 211,500. So you would think that's good, but unfortunately it's a $12,000 difference and they don't like to go below 15,000. So that means they're gonna be borrowing 3,000 to maintain a $15,000 cash balance. The cash balance at the end of quarter two is the beginning balance at quarter three, 15,000. Again, they're expecting a lot more money coming in. And so they have a total amount of cash at 243. They're going to need 220,000 and change to pay out. That's a $22,500 difference. That's well above their $15,000 target. So they're going to pay back the loan with interest and they'll still have over the balance that they want, 19,400. That's the beginning balance. They're going to add this much. So they have a total amount of cash here. They need this much cash for that quarter. That's the difference. That's plenty of money. And that's where they're ending their year. So basically this is a cash budget. You know how to read it and you're gonna to need to know how to do it, a basic one. And it's just that simple. So let's take a look at this. We have a company, Martian Company. They wanna maintain a minimum monthly cash balance of 15,000. A lot of companies have minimum balances in their cash account that they just have to have. It makes perfect sense. So this is just for the month of March. So at the beginning of March, they had $16,500, so that's where that number came from. 
They have cash receipts for March. They're expecting 210,000. So that's where this came from. So the total amount of cash they'll have for March are those two numbers added together. They need $220,000 of disbursements. So of this 22,600, they're gonna need most of it to disperse, leaving them with just $6,500. That's well below the 15,000 they'd like. So they borrow the difference to make it 15,000. And that is how it ends. Questions? <laughs>